Um, okay, so the quantity that each that's sold is one over n plus one. So what happens as n gets large, Nissan? Yeah. What what happens as n gets large? So price is weak. And what happens to quantity? Um, right here. That's the quantity. What happens as n gets large? Decrease. What? To what? Decrease to what? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So as as n rises, the price goes up towards one, and that chokes off all demand. And so the quantity goes to zero. So notice this is exactly the opposite of what happened in Cournot competition, right? In Cournot competition, as the number of firms got large, the markup got very small, and the quantity went to the efficient quantity. Here, the markup is getting very large, and the quantity is going to zero, right? So rather than the markup going to zero, the quantity goes to zero, right? And the reason is that firms don't take into account the fact that when they raise their price, they hurt uh, the other firms too, right? Because if one firm's price is higher, then everybody else is going to sell less, right? Um, and in fact, all the formulas here are exactly the same as the formulas under linear Cournot. And that suggests sort of a deeper similarity between the two situations. In fact, they're equivalent to, or what economists call dual to one another. So let's compare the two problems. So under Cournot, quantity competition, everyone takes everyone else's quantity as given, right? The price is going to depend on the sum of everyone's quantities. And profits are the product of quantity and the, mar and the price, basically, in the market. On the other hand, in the Cournot collaboration problem, everyone takes others' <coughs> prices as given. The quantity depends on the sum of all the prices. And the profits are, again, the product of markup and quantity. So what that says is that these problems are exactly identical, right? You just change the words markup and the word quantity between the two of them, right? And that means that any result in Cournot applies here except in reverse, right? So firms hurt others by raising their price rather than their quantity. Um, and that means that prices are too high even from the perspective <coughs> of the firms. So that means that if the firms were to merge, they would actually be better off rather than, sorry, consumers would actually be better off uh, rather than worse off. So if two firms merge in Cournot, that leads them to reduce their quantities and raise the price. Here it would lose, lead them to reduce their price and therefore raise the quantity. So a merger between two complementary firms is beneficial. So the basic problem here is that each is scrambling to get their piece of the pie. And in the process, they're shrinking the size of the total pot, right? Um, and this leads to a different policy towards vertical mergers. So when one firm supplies something to another, then those two <coughs> firms are complements in the market. Or when they both, when one firm produces left shoes and another firm produces right shoes, it's actually beneficial if those firms merge with one another. And this is why the government takes a very lenient stance towards. Google buying up lots of small companies that supply components into the Google system, whereas they might be very unhappy about Google merging with Yahoo. Right? Um, and the reason it's called vertical is we often draw a diagram where like, you have one firm that supplies to a second firm that supplies to consumers. And these are graphed vertically, so they're called uh, vertical, vertically related. Okay, so as I said, every result that shows up in the Cournot model has to show up here reversed. And we sort of saw in the last slide an example of this. Um, Rokok, more, more generally, what um, is the equivalent of Cournot's theorem but reversed here? What do you think? Uh, so as the number of firms gets large, what happens? As the number of firms gets large, the firms go up. Exactly. So the, um, the, 
Cordeaux's theorem says that as the number of firms gets arbitrarily <coughs> large, everything gets perfectly efficient. Here, as the number of firms gets large, everything gets perfectly inefficient. Everything goes completely to hell and the market totally collapses. Right? Um, so with complements, as the number of firms gets large, uh, the quantity goes to zero. So this is sometimes called Bergstrom's corollary to Cordeaux's theorem. Um, this is very pessimistic, obviously. It says that layers and layers of monopoly eventually kill off the market. It's sometimes also called the tragedy of the commons, because every person is trying to grab their part, and in the process they destroy the social value. Okay, and in fact it's related to an even more famous <coughs> problem called the public goods problem, which we sort of saw in problem set three. So imagine everyone can make some contribution AI to a charity. And each person gets a value out of the total contribution that's made, not out of their individual contribution. And let's say that each person gets some positive value. The derivative of their value with respect to the contribution is positive. And um, therefore, each person receives a value which is equal to their value as a function of the total uh, contribution minus the contribution that they made. Whereas society gets a value capital V, which is the sum of all the individual values. So, um, society would like every individual to set V capital V prime equal to 1, but each individual is instead going to set little v prime equal to 1. Right? Now imagine everyone's symmetric, then this little vi is just going to be the capital V over n. Right? So, um, what each individual will end up doing in equilibrium will be to set capital V prime over N equal to 1, or capital V prime equal to N. But society would rather set it equal to 1. So, if this is the social value that everyone's getting, if everyone does everything privately, we're going to end up up here, where if this is N, whereas the socially optimal thing would be to end up down here, with a much larger amount of contributions to charity. And as n gets large, this is going to keep going up, and it's going to leave nothing to be contributed to the social value. So this is the same result as we just saw. Uh, it's sometimes also called the free rider problem. Everyone is going to hope that other people make the socially valuable contributions to the common good, and is going to take all the private benefit themselves. Right? They're going to free ride. This is also called the collective action problem. So it says that in a large population with voluntary contribution, public goods become arbitrarily underprovided. The dead weight loss <coughs> becomes arbitrarily low. Okay, so what uh, exactly uh, makes something subject to this problem, though? What exactly does it mean that something is a public good? Uh, see, see me out. Does anyone else want to say what the definition of a public good is? The, the classic textbook definition? Yeah. Um, Non-excludable and non rival Yep, and what do those things mean? Um, Non-excludable means that you can't exclude anyone from it. And then non rival means that one person using it doesn't make the product worse for somebody else. Yeah, exactly. So, um, non rival which is sort of the most important condition, is that one person receiving the benefits doesn't preclude anyone else from receiving those benefits. There's zero marginal cost of supplying to additional people. Non-excludable, which is slightly less important, but still important, is um, that everyone receives the benefit regardless of what they do. You can never force anyone to pay or anything like that. Um, and ones that fail the first condition, that are non-excludable but are rival, are called congestible public goods. Ones that fail the second condition but obey the first are called excludable public goods. Um, uh, one example of that might be intellectual property, right? It's easy, it may be in some situations easy to keep people from using some drug, even though it would be costless to provide that drug to them, or very cheap. Um, so <laughs> the real issue in excludability 
is not whether something's excludable or not, absolutely, but how costly it is to exclude people. So like, for example, music used to be basically an excludable public good. It wasn't costly to provide it to other people, but it was easy to keep them from using it. Now it's becoming much less excludable in practice because it's so easy to do file sharing, right? It's becoming hard to keep anyone from using it. Also very important to whether something's a public good, though less part of the classic definition, is who knows what the value of the good is. So most of the things that we call public goods are not like intellectual property. They're not things that were developed by some entrepreneur who had a better sense of how much society would value them than like the people who end up benefiting from them do. Most things we call public goods are things like public transportation where each individual knows how much they're going to use the thing and value the thing before they decide <coughs> whether to make it or not better than any government official does. And so another sort of criterion that makes something, uh, something we analyze as a public good is who knows what its value is. Is that sort of public, known by the public, or is it known more by some entrepreneur? Um, okay, so, but going by the classic definition, Yuto, uh, could you give some examples of pure public goods, ones that satisfy both of these conditions? Uh, like clean air? Yeah, clean that would be a good example. Yeah, those, those are both good examples. So national defense, which is like the nationwide version of that, right? One person being safe doesn't make other people unsafe. Um, environmental services like the weather or, you know, clean air, etc. The existence of certain things like, you know, the fact that, that you're enjoying the existence of, you know, uh, some uh, tribe in Africa doesn't keep someone else from enjoying the existence of that tribe in Africa. Um, ideas are uh, classic examples of public good. So like inventing a new scientific technology or inventing a new theory is something that's almost impossible to keep other people from learning about, right? Uh, though the Nazis certainly tried, but how successfully, I don't know. Uh, and um, the, uh, and it's, and it's non-rival because one person enjoying it doesn't harm other people. Uh, how about congestible public goods? Mariana, can you give some example of congestible public <coughs> goods? Um, is that like, it fails the first criteria that we talked about? So yeah. it would be like um, something that would be like fish in the pond. Yeah, of that's a like good example. It's hard to keep someone from fishing for them, but, uh, but they're, but they're <coughs> non, uh, so therefore they're non-excludable, but um, it's, uh, but one person fishing for them makes it very hard for someone else to, to fish for them. So examples of that are roads and bridges, uh, which can easily get clogged, but it's very hard to keep people from using them. Uh, amenities like lakes, national parks, etc., are um, hard to keep people out of, but they can easily get degraded if too many people use them. Um, and, uh, is that Ajoa here? No. Um, anyone else want to give an example of an excludable public good? Yeah. Music? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so any IP type thing is, is a pretty good example of that. Uh, <coughs> another example might be land reform. So, if you think about, like many, uh, governments take took big estates and broke them up and handed them out to the people who were farming individual plots. And that's pretty close to being non-rival because, you know, the person who's by far the best suited to farm that plot is the person who's been living there and farming it. But you could easily throw that person off their land still, right? Uh, and, and that would be a way to exclude them from the benefits. So yeah, tollway and What? A tollway. Tollway is, wouldn't that, that's starting to get to the point where it's neither excludable non-excludable nor non-rival, so it's not even a, it's neither, you know what I mean? Because tollway definitely gets crowded if there's too many people on it, and once you can exclude people, then it's pretty much not a public good, it's a private good at that point, pretty much. Um, that's a good question. Uh, 
Um, so these are only public goods, but at least as important are public bads. Um, I actually don't think I ended up with any public bars on these slides. Sorry, that's good. Um, okay, so many things bring diffuse harms rather than benefits. So examples of that, those are land takings. So imagine that the government wants to build a road or a bridge or you know a factory, and it needs to get together a bunch of contiguous land. All the land needs to be put together. That means that if we're going to build this thing, it's going to evict a whole bunch of people from their uh, from their houses. And in order, it's not worth doing it unless we can get all of that land together, right? Um, so uh, in that case. It either hurts all the people or none of the people, uh, and that means that basically the harms caused by it are sort of non-rival. That is, imposing the harm on one person doesn't save someone else from experiencing it. All the people have to experience it or none of them. Corporate acquisitions are another similar example. So if someone wants to buy a company, either everyone's going to lose control of the company or no one will lose control of the company, right, uh, of the current shareholders. And so that's... Uh, another example of sort of a public bad. Debt settlements are another example of this. So uh, during the foreclosure crisis, there were tons and tons of people uh, who owned little parts of the housing stock, right? But no one owned any individual house because of the way that things had been securitized. So to renegotiate and stop a foreclosure, everyone uh, would have to have uh, their little bit of the house uh, renegotiated. Um, and this is a big problem in Europe right now as well. Uh, FCC is facing a similar issue, which is that they auctioned off all the spectrum. Now the spectrum is fragmented into all these little parts, but you need to have big contiguous chunks of spectrum in order to put in WiMAX, which would blanket the country in Wi-Fi. Right? And that requires them to put back together all that stuff which requires disenfranchising and <coughs> taking the property from all of the people who are currently occupying those parts of the spectrum. Um, and I've actually been working with them a little bit on this. Another example of that is patent pools. So patent pools are ways of avoiding this multi-marginalization problem that we were talking about earlier, right? If rather than all the patents that for complementary technology being owned by different people, who will each charge a markup, you want to put them all together into one pool where you only have one person in charge of them. That could be very beneficial, but each member uh, has to give up their patent in order for that to work, right? And that can, um, that's another public bad problem. Another example of this might be if we're going to build a new factory and it's going to cause pollution for a lot of people, it might cause some benefit, but it might also pollute a big area, right? And that's going to impact a large number of people. And there's no way you can make it just impact some people and not others. It's going to just, by its nature, pollute a whole area. So these are not really very different from externalities. But in many of these situations, the victims know a lot about how much they're going to be harmed by the, the thing. And that makes it really important for us to get the information from them. And that's, again, this sort of public uh, bad aspect. So the equivalent of the collective action problem here is what's called the holdout problem, which is that if everybody has the right to say, no, this is my land, you're not allowed to take it, right? then um, there, everyone will have an incentive to say, oh, you better pay me a ton, because otherwise your road is not going to get built. You already have the land from everybody else. You know, uh, I want the full value that, that you're getting from this. And if everyone demands that, it's just like the multi-marginalization problem, the whole thing falls apart. Okay. So, um, I, I hope I've persuaded you that this type of problem shows up in a lot of contexts. Um, but, the question is, how, we, how can we try to solve it? So, I'm going to try to argue that you're, often, you're almost always going to need some sort of coercion to solve these types of problems. But first, let's consider what are potential private solutions. So one potential private solution is just that our people are altruistic, right? So people often do public-spirited things like giving to charity, uh, voting, which 
usually there's like almost no chance that they're going to have an impact on who wins the election, and yet they still go and vote. This is sometimes called the paradox of voting, so that's sort of altruistic. Or volunteering for military service, right? Um, and people choose to do these things even though they're not classic self-interest. In problem three, we, we sort of discussed how this could be motivated by something which, while not classic self-interest, is sort of self-interested. So, for example, people might do it for prestige value. They want to look good for other people. Um, it might just make them feel good about themselves that, that they do this, right? Or they could be trying to show other people uh, that they're a good person. And that's a little bit related to the prestige. So, for example, you know, people might give a bunch of money to charity because they um, think that, uh, you know, a potential mate that they might meet will think if they're generous to charity, then they'll also probably be a generous person to them. Or they might think that, you know, for example, I don't know if anyone here is pre-med, but a lot of pre-med people go and, um, like, work as, uh, like, in a hospital, but mostly because that helps them get to medical school, because the medical school thinks that they're a good person if they're willing to go and do that volunteering, right? Um, so, it's no, there's no question that altruism and these types of motivations can help to solve some of these problems. That was the whole point of your problem set, uh, one of your questions on problem set three. But almost all of these things require the slow development of culture, and that usually takes 50 or 100 or maybe even 1,000 years. So the Soviet Union tried to solve all of the problems of social organization by just inspiring a spirit of altruism in people, and that didn't work terribly well. Um, so, uh, in many situations, like the you know land assembly thing, if we had hundreds and hundreds of years, yeah, we might be able to develop a spirit in people that you know it will be really respected if you make the sacrifice to give up your land to help build the bridge. But that's probably not likely to work quickly enough. Uh, for it to really solve the problem. So, if goods or bads are local, another private solution might be for people to move. So, for example, uh, people can move to the place that supplies the good or the bad well. This is called tibu competition. And the idea is that local areas compete to attract people and to provide the best public services, like street cleaning, schools, police, fire, etc. But this crucially depends on mobility, that is, people need to be able to cheaply move to the best area, and the value of the good provided needs to not depend on the location. So, for example, um, it, you know, if California did a terrible job of providing outdoor uh, places to swim, uh, it wouldn't be very effective for Minnesota to uh, provide um, that really well, because it's frozen half the year in Minnesota. Right? And so the whole value depends on being in the warm climate. Right? Um, but, but once you can move easily, that basically makes things excludable. Right? Because you cannot allow someone to move to the area unless they're willing to pay for it. It also makes things rival, effectively, because there's only so many people that can live in any given place. Right? So in some sense, these, are, these local public goods are not real public goods in the sense of the things we were describing before. So, the most famous solution to the public goods problem uh, was come up with by these two Swedish guys, Lindahl and Mixell. And um, what they uh, proposed uh, is easiest to describe in the case where we're just making a binary decision. So we're just deciding, should we build some project, like a road or a bridge or whatever, or not, um, rather than how much of something we should do. And everything that we're going to do from now on, I'm going to do in terms of this binary uh, project, but it all applies to a broader issue of how much we, we can do as well. So let's focus on this binary case. So imagine every citizen gets some value VI from... Um, if the project is built, but the cost of undertaking the project is capital C. Um, one thing we could do uh, is figure out, imagine we knew every person's value, VI, 
we could compute what their share of the total value is, SI, uh, which is the ratio of their value to the total value that everyone has, capital V. Um, now, if the uh, project is efficient, that is, if capital V is greater than capital C, then it's also the case that if every person were forced to pay their share of the value in the cost, they would all want to build the project. Why is that? Well, if V is greater than C, then VI is going to be greater than VI over V times C, right? Because you can just cancel the VIs, and this is the same as 1 being greater than C over V, which is exactly what you want. So here's what we could do. We could say, um, look, everybody is being assigned their share, and they have to pay that share of the cost. And then everyone could choose to either agree to uh, make their contribution, which is their share of the cost, or not to. If everybody pays the share, we build the project. If nobody pay, if anybody fails to pay the share, if even one person disagrees, then we don't build the project. Right? This is called uh, Vixellian unanimity. And notice that this will work perfectly. Everyone will agree if and only if the project is, is efficient. Yeah, Matt. But how could this ever actually work? Wait, wait, wait. That's, that's, getting, that's exactly the punchline, so don't, don't steal my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if everyone is pivotal in the decision, everything is fine. Everybody has the right to veto, and therefore everyone is going to want to make the contribution if we know exactly the right share that they have, right? <coughs> um, but would this really work in practice? is Matt's question. Good question. Okay. So, probably not. And Lucy, uh, could you tell us why this might not actually work in practice? Um, why was Matt so pissed off a minute ago? Because we need to know everyone's actual, like, their value and their share. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, well, so one problem, which is the less severe problem, but is also a problem, is that this system might not be very credible, right? Imagine that, like, 99 out of 100 people agree, and they're all really enthusiastic. And then there's one person who says no. Well, it's going to be really tempting at that point to say, okay, let's just raise that person's contribution from the rest of the 99 people, right? But if you do that, everyone's going to anticipate that, right? And then nobody's, everyone's going to say, oh, I'm not contributing, right? Um... But more importantly, you don't know people's values, right? And everybody has to agree, right? So if you misestimate anyone's value by a little bit, then it's going to get really dangerous, right? Because even though, you know, it may be very, very low probability that, any pers that you get it wrong enough that any person disagrees, with a ton of people, the chance that one person says no is going to get really, really high. Right? Um, and that's why it's really hard to imagine using this system, because one unexpectedly stubborn person can ruin it for everybody else. Right? And we can study this formally by crunching the numbers. So let's imagine that everyone has some value vi, and everyone has equal shares, 1 over n. And that the distribution of people's values is, because we don't know it exactly, it's drawn from some distribution f of vi uh, I independently and identically across people. Okay. So then the probability that any individual rejects the uh, rejects con contributing is going to be the probability that their value is less than this, which is <coughs> f of c over n. What is c here? The cost of the project. <laughs> So then the probability that any individual agrees is going to be 1 minus f of c over n. And the probability that everyone agrees is going to be 1 minus f of c over n to the n. So imagine, and this seems pretty implausible, that we know people's values so precisely that we can make sure that only one person in every thousand would not want to agree to the project, right? That seems like really ambitious. Um, 
But then, once we have a thousand people, which is not a very big society, right? We already have a 30, only a 35% chance of success. And once we get to the size of a small town, like 10,000, we are down to 1 in 20,000 being the chance of success. Um, now, in principle, if different people had different distributions, we could adjust the shares that they're given using like some elasticity thing. But still, we're always going to end up in this situation where there's going to be a very, very high chance of failure. So this is the example I gave. Um, as a function of the number of people, what happens to the probability of success if the chance of any person saying no is one in a thousand? So, yeah, it's reasonably high when we've got, you know, a small number of people, but then it just, like, very quickly dies off as we get up to, you know, even three or 4,000 people. Okay. So, this is not just true of this simple system that I described, where we just make every person, you know, the, uh, attempt to leave an offer, and everyone has to, you know, either consent to their share or not agree. But, in fact, it's true of any system. So imagine that rather than just saying to everyone, you know, here's how much you have to contribute, contribute or don't, we ask people to say, okay, how much do you want to contribute? Well, as soon as we do that, then we're back to the collective action problem, because everyone's going to try to contribute less. On the other hand, if we don't let people say how much they want to contribute, and we just say, look, contribute or don't, then we're exactly in this situation. So we're basically damned if we do, damned if we don't ask people for what their values are. And this is uh, the basis of a very fundamental theorem, which extends the Bergstrom corollary that we said. This is called the Maillot and Postelweight system. And it says, if everyone has to consent in order for the public project to go through, and there are no external funds available, then the probability that the project is undertaken <coughs> always goes to zero as the number of people gets large. Um, in other words, no private, and by private I mean voluntary and self-financing system, can ever work. Um, that is, we always run into the collective action problem. Public projects, either good or bad, will always require some coercion. And um, uh, we did this in the binary case, but in the case where it's a quantity, it's basically the same conclusion. Any system will always lead to almost nothing being contributed as the number of people get large. Okay, so coercion uh, can basically operate in two different ways, which are uh, meant to address these two conditions, that it's be voluntary and self-financing. And so Raj, how, how can you imagine uh, coercion uh, dealing with each of those two problems? Um, if you have like a government that's taxing government these products, then you have the financing issue of this voluntary issue. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be self-financing if the government can raise taxes from outside. And how could it, how could just, uh, if it's not voluntary, how could we solve this problem? If this situation is like, is it so if we don't have to, if it doesn't have to be voluntary, if the government can coerce people, how, how might the government solve this problem? Is that the tax coercive? Well, yeah, so I mean, if you just tax the people in the community, so in some, in some sense, these are exactly the same solutions, right? We can either tax people outside of the community, or we can tax people inside of the community, but both things we need to coercively tax people, right? Okay, so uh, we, can make, we can force the people in the community to consent to giving the money by taxing them, basically, or we can raise external funds. Um, uh, because charity is probably going to be insufficient, we're going to have to raise taxes. So both strategies are identical to coercive tax raising. Now, um, one form of this in practice shows up with public bads when we want to force people to consent <coughs> to uh, putting their property together. Um, Amanda, how, what, what is that system called in practice when the government forces people to give up their uh, land for a public project. 
you're not from the U.S., so it's a little bit unfair to you. It has a very specific name in the U.S. Someone who's from the U.S., do you, does anyone, anyone know what it's called? Yeah, eminent domain. Got it, that's very cool. Um, uh, Yeah, so the government can force people to consent to a land assembly, uh, and it's called the power of eminent domain. Um, I actually think in Brazil the government doesn't have that power. That's one big problem in the favelas. But um, so uh, one way they can do it is they can raise funds from the beneficiaries, right, for public good. As Raj was saying, they can coerce people to contribute, right? Local communities often raise property taxes, cities raise general revenue for many services, um, and this is true for much of non-national uh, non spending. In public baths, what's that called is eminent domain. So the government can force you to give up your property, um, and usually they're forced to pay you some sort of a quote-unquote just compensation. But these are usually based on the fair market value for land, rather than how much the individual person actually feels that their property is worth to them given that it you know, belonged to their family and so forth. And so this ca has caused a lot of social outrage because people are pissed off about their land being taken and then the government giving them you know, whatever perfunctory amount. <coughs> um, and in fact, this has been dramatically expanded by the Supreme Court in recent years, which has allowed it to be used not just for like building a public road or something, but also for uh, like building a factory or building a commercial complex or a shopping mall um, or something like that. So uh, this, has, uh, this has been a big issue of public debate in recent years. Similar mechanisms exist for corporate debt or corporate acquisition. So when a majority of people vote to accept an offer for a company being bought, it's not like the few uh, remaining people can say, no, this is my share of the company, I don't want to give it up. They're forced to give it up if the majority votes for it. And that happens in some debt settlements. Some debt contracts have provisions where the government comes in and actually says, okay, uh, because most people are willing to renegotiate this loan so that people don't get foreclosed on, we're going to force everyone else to accept that. Um, and also, you can collect some money coercively from outside to help ease the problem. So sometimes local cities get subsidies in making their schools better or something like that uh, in order to try to solve part of this problem. Okay, so um, uh, if we're going to use coercion from the government, we need to figure out whether it's worth using that coercion or not. Right? Um, because that's not going to be determined by the market system and people freely interacting with one another. Some collective decision has to be made. This is called the problem of social choice. Uh, and it's very similar to the issues that we discussed with externalities. How do we figure out what the externalities are? And uh, Alexandra, what were the ways that we talked about uh, when we talked about assessing externalities that the government can try to figure out what, what the of externalities were. There were basically three ways we talked about it. Um, like in our concepts, we were talking about like... In, in the class on ass assessing externalities, right, okay. we talked about three ways the government can go about it. Um, just like getting an outside expert to look at... Outside out. expert? That's right. Yeah. That's good. That's one. Does anyone remember the other two? Yeah, Mike? You could have surveys which, like, you said, would be very effective. Yeah, that's right. Those, so those were the two other main ones that, that we talked about. So assessment by experts, surveys, and the fancy Vickery Clark Groves method, right? <coughs> Um, and these three things are used with sort of declining frequency because, you know, we have experts play a huge role in public policy, right? Uh, surveys maybe play a little bit of a role, 
And the, I don't think anyone's ever used a Vickery Clark Groves mechanism to make a serious public decision. Um, so, um, the, uh, Jolene, uh, what do you think might be some of the differences here um, versus uh, the setting that we talked about when we talked about assessing externalities, which might change what we want to do? Yeah, people's, we, we said that sort of one aspect of public goods is that people's opinions are really important, mm -hmm. right? That, that we really, it's really important to get information from people, so we might not be so happy with uh, just letting an expert decide on these things, right? Um, so that's one important difference. Another thing is that a lot of these decisions are relatively simple. They're like binary things. They're not like how much of an externality it is or what's the right level of something but just should we undertake some project, right? Um, and there's also a very large <coughs> number of individuals involved. So in many of these settings, we therefore want to get some input from people, but they fancy mechanisms and surveys don't work. So something that's often used is voting. And what do I mean by voting? Well, the simplest form of voting is everyone has, you know, one man, one vote, and there's just a majority rule. But you could also not have not just majority rule, you could say, well, two-thirds of the people need to agree, right? or, you know, seven-fifths, uh, five-sevenths of the people need to agree or something like that. And not everyone might have the same number of votes. So in a corporate acquisition, your voting is determined not by, you know, one man, one vote, but rather by how many shares you own in the company, right? So this leaves us having to trade off or combine a range of different imperfect ways of making social decisions. So, uh... Song Ping, yeah. um, what are some of the pros and cons of having an expert make a decision about these things that we talked about? Well, if it's an expert, it's like an outsider, so there's like, he's got less of an incentive to like make a decision either way. Mm -hmm. But then like, you also run into the problem that if he's an outsider, then would he really like know what's going on? Yeah, so those are two good downsides, what are, what are the benefits of, of an expert? Um, well, he, well, as an expert, he'll know more about the issue. Yeah. So, he will get a more well-rounded advice. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, you know, the thing that he has less incentive is in some ways good, because you don't run into all the incentive problems trying to get the things out of him. He may give a sort of dispassionate uh, account of of what the right right answer is. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, um, but on the other hand, he leaves out a lot of the important information that the individuals in the <coughs> It's sort of undemocratic to have an expert decide. Um, Mike, uh, what, what do you think some of the ups and downs of the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism? So, so it tells, like, Because uh, <coughs> it's like they, they need to like <coughs> right? so there's like Yeah, and there's the collusion problem, right? And the fact that all the money goes away and then you have to burn all the money and that, that would be really problematic, right? So Vickery Clark Grove Mechanism has these good sort of theoretical things, but in practice it doesn't seem to really make much sense. Right? How about voting? Uh, Navid? Is Navid here? <coughs> Navid? Yeah. Um, so the pros would be that it's um, really simple if you set a majority rule yeah. uh, previously, you can easily see where the majority lies. Yeah. Um, some cons, maybe that you could have the like you know tyranny of the majority if there's just enough people to um, by some chance if there's just enough people to get the vote passed, but yeah. There's still a very large part of society that's against it. Yeah. That could be, you know, ignoring the, the needs of the community. Yeah, so I mean, the good thing is it, it provides a simple way to incorporate individual values, but it doesn't have that close of a connection to efficiency necessarily, right? A majority of people could be in favor, but that doesn't, there, but there could be a few people who are like incredibly against, 
and a bunch of people who are just weakly in favor. And there's no way to sort of take into account the fact that some people feel very strongly in one way or the other, right? So it, it's all based on the me median of the distribution of people's values rather than on the mean, which is what really matters. So despite this, it seems like two is just like wildly impractical, right? And one and three <coughs> both have benefits and costs relative to one another. So it seems like in practice we'd like to combine elements of one and three. And Frushan, um, what system of government do you think would combine elements of one and, and three? Um, like, you know, like some sort of like a philosopher king or like a... Uh, <laughs> That's sort of system one. Yeah, system one like is philosopher king. Like the philosopher king is sort of elected by, uh, elected by a group of people, so it's like a combination of a republic and a philosopher king. And so what... <laughs> What, 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 do you, what practical system of government does that, do you think? Uh, I guess the, like our system. Yeah, pretty much. That's, that's, that's the whole idea behind representative democracy. We're supposed to elect the, the best people among us to... Now, does it ever all, always work out that way? Maybe not. But at least the philosophy behind the representative democracy is exactly combining systems. <coughs> so uh, we've sort of come up with an economic justification, at least in the abstract, for why you would want to have a representative democracy. Um, uh, so I've been doing some research recently on alternative systems um, that try to improve on some of these things, but I, 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 won't, I won't waste your time with that. So instead, I'll just uh, finish by wrapping up the term. So um, this term, we tried to explore some of the I think most fundamental trade-offs that our society faces in determining how to organize its economy and society. Um, and I hope that that gave you a better, more nuanced and less ideological understanding of some of these fundamental trade-offs. So, um, you know, when you hear people in the media debating about capitalism and, and socialism, uh, and so forth, um, these are usually viewed as these two polar systems and people are totally in favor of one and totally against one another and they lump together a whole set of different institutions and trade-offs into like, I'm pro-market or I'm, or I'm you know, pro-government or something like that. And I hope um, to have shown you that, in fact, the things which make up capitalism and the things which make up socialism are very complex not necessarily all that related to one another, and that we can actually quantify the trade-offs between those different institutions, so that rather than just ideologically debating about one system versus the other, we can actually try to measure the costs and benefits of different parts of each system. So in, let me try to go through a few examples of, of what we did. So one trade-off is between uh, has to do with externalities and public goods. On the one hand, we know that if we don't internalize externalities, if we don't try to provide public goods, the theorems that we, we showed were that things can be very, very bad. There can be a lot of distortions from that. On the other hand, there's really no very good system for solving these problems. The best we can do is combine voting, which is very imperfect, with expert analysis, which is also very imperfect. So there's a trade-off between the costs of using the political system and the costs of ignoring the market failures, right? So that's one set of trade-offs that we face. A second one is the trade-off between redistributing income uh, and providing social insurance on the one hand and dampening people's incentives to work hard on the other hand, right? And that's a very different set of trade-offs. And it has to do with how elastic people are and how much inequality there is in society. So again, one side of this is sort of more socialist and one side of it is more capitalist. But this, the things that determine the trade-off, things we need to quantify to determine it, are very different than what we need to determine whether we should internalize externalities or not. Right? Uh, third thing we explored was the trade-off between uh, sort of regulation and prizes on one hand as a government intervention versus a more market-oriented system based on market power. So there the trade-off was between the static dead weight loss created by the monopoly power 
and the benefits of creative destruction, entrepreneurship, cost-reducing, innovation, on the other hand, right? Um, and again, quantifying that requires measuring very different things than either the issues of redistribution or the issues of internalizing externalities. And finally, we talked about competition policy um, against cartels and mergers, where we had to trade off the economies of scale that come from putting things together under one management uh, versus the um, deadweight loss from the monopoly and the reduction in the competitive dynamics of the economy. And that, again, is a trade-off that's often viewed as like, you know, one of a disaggregated competitive system versus a very aggregated one that takes advantage of the economies of scale like they had in the Soviet Union. Um, so uh, these are all uh, really crucial trade-offs. They're all different from one another. Uh, and they all, you know, people may have different opinions along different of these dimensions. So there's not a capitalism and a socialism. There's a series of market-oriented institutions, and there's a series of uh, government-led institutions. And you know, hopefully this class helps you think about how you can make a determination about how you feel about each of these. And hopefully by that, we can help overcome this trade-off that we talked about between the voting system and the expertise-based system uh, by you all becoming uh, and combining in one person the expert and the voter uh, and, and thereby helping to improve uh, our society. So thanks, uh, thanks for making an attempt to do that. That's it. <laughs>